Welcome back to Roots Music History. On this podcast, we talk about the stories behind songs and legends, as well as new up-and-coming artists in a playlist called Roots History in the Making. But on today's episode, we are going to dig up the roots of the famous song Hallelujah, originally written by Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen was born on September 21st, 1934. He was born into an extremely religious and spiritual family. His original name was a Hebrew name, Eliezer, which translates to God helps. His mother, Masha, was 29 years old when she had him. His father was 14 years older than Masha. He was 43 when Eliezer was born. His mother, Masha, was the daughter of a very well-known rabbi. She had grown up in an affluent household. And when she married Leonard's father, whose name was Nathan, Nathan was also very affluent. So they were very much so in the same social class, obviously also held the same beliefs, a very strict Jewish Orthodox environment. A lot of you don't know this, but I was also raised Orthodox, and I am Orthodox to this day, so I very much can relate to the Orthodox environment. I'm going to call him Leonard instead of Eliezer, just because that's how we all recognize him today. His father always dressed extremely well, always in a suit. Even if it was an informal gathering, Nathan Cohen would show up in a suit. Leonard Cohen really adopted this kind of mentality. You very rarely, if ever, saw Leonard Cohen not dressed, you know, very pristine and tidy and decent in a nice suit or a nice outfit. He was a very put together person in that sense. He admits as he gets older that he learned his tidiness and his decency from his father. His mother was very musical. She was always singing around the house and very involved in the synagogue and the music that came out of the synagogue. He says he really thinks that he got his musical side from his mother and every other personality trait from his father. Leonard was also growing up in a very affluent environment. His father owned a very high-end clothing store, which I'm sure was one of the reasons he dressed really well all of the time. And his father was also a veteran, having served in World War I. For the most part, his upbringing was really, really good. He was very comfortable, his mother was very sweet and loved music, and his father was a very sturdy, put-together person with a good income and good faith. So when his father was 52 years old and passed away, when Leonard was 9 years old, this absolutely destroyed Leonard. He was devastated at his father father's death and very surprised because as a young child, you don't fully understand that your father was in a war and that your father has injuries and illnesses as a result of being in combat. It doesn't fully, it's not something you fully comprehend. So to Leonard, his father's passing was kind of sudden, whereas to his wife and to other people who knew him as adults, they knew that he was sick. They knew he had these injuries and that he wasn't really doing well. But Leonard was so devastated when his father died. He says that's when he really started turning to words and to poetry to cope with that grief. There was a moment Leonard remembers where he took a notepad and he wrote something down to his father on the notepad. He took the notepad paper, folded it up, and took one of his father's ties. Then he took a knife and cut open his father's tie so that there was a little slit in the tie. And he put the piece of paper into his father's tie and then buried the tie in the backyard. It was almost like burying his father again, but in his own backyard, in his own way. And he says this was the first time he really used words in a spiritual, sacramental way. Since that moment, Leonard really felt the power of words and the power that words have to express life and to express the afterlife. After his father's death, he really turned to poetry and to writing as a form of escapism. But he was also very involved in school. So once Leonard got into high school, he was on pretty much every team that the high school offered. He had a lot of different friends and acquaintances, but he was also very heavily into poetry. By the time Leonard was 15 years old, he had published his very first book of poetry. I mean, he could technically call himself a published poet at age 15. It wasn't until Leonard got into his 20s that he started to pick up the acoustic guitar. And he doesn't say this exactly, but I can't help but think the ladies had something to do with this because every guitarist on earth, the reason they pick up a guitar is because they want to get the girls. You know, Harry Chapin admits to this, James Taylor admits to this, pretty much every Jeff Beck, everyone admits that they started playing guitar to get the girls. But the problem was Leonard never really had formal musical training. He didn't fully understand music theory. He actually couldn't read music at all, so the way he was writing and playing music was very elementary. He only had a couple of chords, but it was his lyrics and the words behind his songs that really started catching people's attention around him. 
Even though Leonard was playing music and writing his own songs in his 20s, he definitely was not pursuing a career in the music industry. In fact, he was putting most of his effort into his writing. And by the time he was 33, he had two novels that he had written and was now calling himself a novelist as well as a poet. To market his second book, he would go on TV shows and do interviews while also singing one of his original songs. In one of the TV shows that he went on to market his book, he came onto the stage playing the guitar and singing a song, the crowd was kind of confused and the audience was confused. They thought, wasn't this guy here to promote his book? After he played his song, which was only two chords, just F and A, he sat down and said, okay, let's talk about the book that I wrote. <laughs> he called himself a poet, a novelist, a songwriter, and a singer. He called himself everything. In fact, he started to receive some criticism because he was just kind of this renaissance man who did everything. And a lot of people thought this is just some rich kid who grew up in an affluent household who always could do anything he wanted and have anything he wanted wanted. And here he is thinking he's just going to publish a book. He's going to be a poet. He's going to write a song. In three years, he's going to decide he wants to go to law school and then he'll be a doctor. It's just he was very all over the place. So it seemed. But to Leonard, Leonard knew his soul. And to Leonard, he was always the same person. He always just loved words and loved trying to capture the essence of life, whether that be in a novel, in a poem, or in a song. It was also in his early 30s, he started traveling quite a bit. He sort of had a rotation where he would rotate between Montreal, Canada, and New York City, and Idra, Greece. Now don't come after me for pronouncing Idra wrong because I am Greek and I speak Greek. And if I'm ever gonna pronounce anything right on this podcast, it's going to be a Greek word or a Greek island. Now I've actually been to Idra several times. It's a beautiful island. It is very, very small as well. The sunsets are incredible. So I just want you to picture that sort of Grecian island beauty as we talk about Leonard's time in Idra, Greece. It was in his mid-30s that he met a woman on this island named Marianne. Marianne had a six-month-old baby and her husband had just abruptly left the two of them. So she was left to raise this baby on her own but she and Leonard immediately hit it off, and Leonard actually started flying Marianne from Greece to New York City and to Montreal, and she started joining him on this rotation from city to city, country to country. They were actually together for just shy of 10 years, and for Leonard, he was really just taking off with what he wanted to be doing with his music. Leonard was also receiving criticism because he was a little bit older. He was 32, 33 years old when he was trying to make it on the scene as a novelist or a poet or a songwriter or whatever he wanted to be. A lot of people looked at Leonard and thought, shouldn't you have a more stable career at this point instead of just kind of hopping around from thing to thing? But for Leonard, he wanted this. He wanted to be distinguished in the industry, or as he described as a, quote, elder. He saw that there was wisdom in his age, and he refused to let them deter him from trying to pursue these dreams and continue doing what he loved. And also, he had enough money from his family anyway. He didn't really need a stable career. It was around 1966 when Leonard met someone named Judy Collins. Judy was a singer. Unlike the other singers in the industry and unlike some of the other producers in the industry, Judy was willing to actually listen to Leonard's music. Now, most people were just kind of shying away from his music. They thought he was kind of a joke. They thought the music was weird and very elementary. I mean, like I said, his song only had two chords, F and A. So it was just very kind of obscure for what most people were used to. Judy was captivated by it. She loved it. And Judy says, we never had a love affair. We were never in love, but she really appreciated his music and was willing to give it a chance. She heard a song that Leonard had written called Suzanne. Judy absolutely loved it. She said to Leonard, you know, I would love to record this song, Suzanne. And Leonard said, sure. Now at this point, Leonard was with Marianne. He later meets someone named Suzanne. Maybe he manifested that with this song. Judy loves it and she does end up recording it. It ended up being one of her most popular songs on her album. About a year or so after meeting Judy, Judy invites Leonard to come play the song Suzanne with her on stage at this fundraiser that was at a theater and was drawing in a bunch of really big name acts. I think Jimi Hendrix was one of the acts at this fundraising event. Leonard coming to this event, this was a big deal for him. Yeah, he was playing playing on TV shows now and then, promoting his book or playing to small crowds, but he had never played anything this big before and had never been in the room with these other types of people before. 
Leonard agrees to come to the fundraising event, but he was extremely nervous. At one point, Judy is on the stage and she's playing the song Suzanne, and Leonard was supposed to come out with his guitar and join her. Leonard starts playing the guitar in the background on the stage and realizes that the guitar is out of tune. He's not very good at tuning guitars. He doesn't even read sheet music, you know, but he knows it doesn't sound right, so he just kind of panicked and walked off the stage. Thankfully, it ends up being through this connection with Judy, Leonard ends up meeting a guy named John Hammond. John Hammond was already a very well-known record producer. He had worked with some other very big names, including, but not limited to, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Aretha Franklin. At some point, he even worked with Stevie Vaughan. I think that might have been later, though. But he was just very well-known in the industry and very well-connected. John Hammond ends up putting Leonard in touch with a man named Clive Davis. Clive Davis, at this time, was the head of Columbia Records. Clive Davis was also an Orthodox Jew. Clive absolutely loved Leonard Cohen. It ends up being through Clive Davis, Leonard gets a publishing deal at Columbia Records. And from about 1967 through 1972-ish, he records a couple of albums at Columbia Records. In these years, things are going really well for Leonard. Even though he and Marianne had broken it off, he had this traction now with Clive Davis and Columbia Records. He's writing and he's recording and he ends up meeting in 1969 a very beautiful 24-year-old named Sue. Suzanne. And that's what it says, that he met her in 1969. So let's believe that. Leonard was 34 years old at the time, and even though he was completely infatuated and in love with Suzanne, he never actually married her. He says that he was fearful and just kind of a coward. Nothing could deny how Leonard felt about Suzanne. He really did love her. Suzanne ended up giving birth to Leonard's two children, a boy named Adam and a girl named Lorca, I think. I hope I'm saying that right. And I will just say, even though he never married Suzanne and they ended up parting ways about 10 years later, he had this very strong bond with his family. And Suzanne was actually on his album cover for Death of a Ladies Man, which comes later, but I'm kind of skipping ahead. I just want to emphasize how strong his bond was with his family. His daughter Lorca also joined him on his 2008 tour as a videographer and a photographer. So he speaks about his family quite often and what a strong bond they have. It was just very Kourtney Kardashian, Scott Disick of them to not get married. <laughs> now I know I just skipped ahead a little bit and I mentioned his album, Death of a Ladies Man. So let's back up a little bit because someone very important has to enter the scene here a man named John Lissauer. It was 1972 when a 22-year-old boy is playing at a hotel. He's a little weirded out because while most people are with their friends or their family at tables, drinking and being merry and talking, there's one man who's standing right by the stage just staring at him in a very nice suit with one hand in his suit pocket and the other just dangling, just making eye contact at the singer. John is playing, kind of looking at the guy, and after he finishes, this man approaches him and says, my name is Leonard Cohen. I really love your music. Is there any chance you'd be interested in recording with me? Well, John Lasauer was 22 years old. He's a young guy, very unknown. No one has ever approached him to record anything before. To John, this is a really big break for him. In true Leonard fashion, after Leonard meets someone that he absolutely loves, he flies them back to New York. <laughs> and he kind of puts them on his flying rotation from Idra to Montreal to New York to LA. So immediately, John Lasauer is part of his little entourage here. And Leonard ends up flying him to New York City. After John Lasauer came to New York City, he recorded about eight or nine songs with Leonard Cohen. They ended up putting out an album and going on tour, and things were going really, really well for them. Eventually, Leonard said to John, hey, instead of just playing with me, would you like to actually co-write? John was like, well, what do you mean? Do you mean I write lyrics or I take your poems and put them to music? Leonard was like, yes. And John was like, which one? <laughs> And Leonard was like, why don't you take my poems and put them to music? That sounds good. So John was like, okay. And Leonard says to him, look, I'm going to go to LA for a while, but why don't you come with me? I'm going to be staying at this hotel. There's a piano in the room and we can just kind of sit there for a couple of days and write, get another album together. And John is over the moon. He's like, that'd be great. So John and Leonard go to LA, get a hotel room, spent maybe four days in this hotel room, just hunkered down and writing. They knocked out, John said, six or seven songs. They leave. Everything's great. Great. And Leonard says to him, all right, I'm going to go to Idra, Greece for a little while. And once I come back to New York City, let's finish this up and get this album out there. And John's like, great, that sounds good. Leonard went to Idra. John didn't hear from him for eight years. Eight. 
And it's not like Leonard was a missing person. He does disappear later in his life. We're gonna talk about that later in the video. But in this case, it's not like he was in Greece for eight years. Like he met some Grecian woman and spent eight years, you know, on this island with her. Nay, nay, he came back to America. He came back to New York City. And not only did he come back to New York City, but he was actively working in New York City, putting out music and working with a new composer named Phil Spector doing interviews, having a documentary made about him, he just wasn't calling John back. And nobody really knows why. You could speculate it's because he got connected with Phil Spector. And Phil Spector at that time was huge. He was doing a lot of really big names in the industry. It was very serendipitous the way this all went down. And it's not to say that Leonard Cohen didn't plan to call John back. You know, it's possible he just came back to the States and then these events sort of began to unravel where he comes back and he was actually in LA, not New York. He was playing at the Troubadour, which I talk about a lot in some of my other videos, Hotel California's documentary, And I think I talk about it in my Fleetwood Mac Roots documentary too. While Leonard Cohen was playing there and Phil Spector happened to be there, he saw Leonard Cohen performing and loved his style. It was very, very different from anyone else at that time. So after the show, Phil Spector goes up to Leonard Cohen and says, hey, I loved your show tonight. Why don't you come back to my mansion? He was extremely wealthy. Have a little dinner party with me and my girl and you can bring Suzanne. Leonard Cohen was like, yeah, of course. He knew who Phil Spector was. Leonard and Suzanne go to his house after their show at the Troubadour where Phil and Leonard would proceed to get stinking drunk. Just very, very, very drunk, very drunk. And at one point, Leonard and Suzanne were trying to leave his house and Phil told his staff to lock all the doors and lock them in so they couldn't leave. And then Phil forced Leonard to play the piano with him. Then eventually Phil just fell asleep and was completely passed out. And then Leonard and Suzanne were able to leave his house. It was just crazy. There's been a lot of really weird collaborations in the music industry over the years, but the Phil Spector and Leonard Cohen collaborations are just very bizarre. And I think Phil Spector was just such a strange, erratic person and borderline dangerous. I mean, I, I wouldn't even say borderline. Phil Spector was a dangerous person. He, first of all, was definitely an alcoholic. Second of all, he had a habit, a very bad habit, of pulling guns on people that he liked and that were good good collabs for him. He pulled a gun on John Lennon at one point. He pulled a gun on someone else. It was a fiddler. I forget. But he also pulled a gun on Leonard Cohen at one point in a very weird way. He like pulled the gun and put the gun up to Leonard's face and then whispered in his ear that he loved him. He was such a strange person and to be honest, a very bad influence. But Leonard had already connected with Phil. Leonard knew of the connections that Phil had. And Leonard was very excited to be working with Phil overall. So that's probably one of the biggest reasons Leonard never called John back because he kind of saw Phil as this big break for him in a way. But in the meantime, this relationship with Phil, I believe was putting a huge strain on every other aspect of Leonard's life. Things started going really badly with him and Suzanne, for example. And part of that too could have been Leonard might have been getting a big head thinking that everything was going to fall in place for him, that now he's some big rock star. You know, it just seems like ever since Phil Spector entered Leonard's life, he went into this downward spiral. So his relationship with Suzanne really starts to fall apart. He's also feeling like he's losing control of his work. One of the things that happened when Leonard Cohen and Phil Spector were putting together the album Death of a Ladies Man, there was one moment that really made Leonard mad. He was in Phil's house recording some tracks for the album. Leonard was under the impression these were just rough vocals, not the final product. He and Phil were drinking in this session. Leonard was pretty drunk when he was doing these vocals. If you haven't seen my Roots documentary on the story behind the song, I Put a Spell on You, the singer Screamin' Jay Hawkins was blackout drunk when he recorded uh, I Put a Spell on You. It wasn't until after his band had sobered up and re-listened to it, they brought it to Jay and said, this was actually really good, Jay. I actually think you should record this. So it was kind of that environment where Leonard Cohen is drinking. I don't know that he was blacked out, but he was definitely drunk. Did not think this was a final product whatsoever. The next day, Phil Spector took all of those tracks, all those tapes, loaded it in his car, took them to a location, didn't tell anybody where he was going, and then secretly put together those tracks and mixed them as a final product for the album. He did have the decency to bring it to Leonard and say, okay, here we go. Here's the final version. But Leonard hated it. He said, this is 
is not a final version. These were rough vocals. I was drunk when I did them. I don't want this to be the final version that goes onto the album. Phil Spector did not care and went ahead and proceeded with Columbia to put out these vocals on the album. For a long time, Leonard hated the album Death of a Ladies Man because he knew he was drunk when he was singing it. And a lot of people also didn't really like the album for a long time. But eventually it seems like that album started to grow on folks, especially after the song Hallelujah was born. Now, after this whole ordeal with Phil Spector, the year now is around 1979. Leonard ends up doing a tour for the album, but after that tour, he was so fed up with Phil, with his drinking. He and Suzanne had completely fallen apart and were separating. He just was in this downward spiral. He decides, of course, what do you do when you're sad? Go to Hawaii. What have we learned on Roots Rockumentaries? Whenever someone's upset with the band, they flee the mainland and they go to Hawaii. You'll know this if you've seen some of my other Roots rockumentaries of people who get upset and go to Hawaii. Not to name any names, but Bernie Leadon with the Eagles, Scream and Jay Hawkins, I put a spell on you. They all fled to Hawaii when they got upset. In Leonard's case, he went to Idra. That's his happy place. That's where he goes. So he went there. Soon after getting to Idra, he ends up meeting another woman named Dominique. The ladies' man has not died. Dominique almost reminds me of what I imagine his mother to have been like. His mother was, oh, it was either, what was she? Lithuanian. I think that's it. And Dominique kind of reminds me, she has kind of this Lithuanian vibe to her. She might even be Lithuanian. I haven't even looked into that, but it makes complete sense to me why Leonard fell in love with Dominique. She's funny. She speaks very well. That time, she, I believe, was a photographer, a fashion photographer. She's creative as well, and she really had an appreciation for the deep side of Leonard, that deep thinking old soul that he had. I think it's very cute, his relationship with Dominique. I fully support it. <laughs> <laughs> and at this time, you know, Leonard is just trying to regroup because that stuff with Phil was downright crazy. While he's in Greece with Dominique, he starts writing music again. It wasn't until 1984, so about four years after he moved to Greece and had been writing music, Leonard calls up John, the guy he ghosted for eight years. John says he picks up the phone and Leonard's on the other side and he just goes, Hey, John, how you been? John was like... Fine. Leonard said, well, how would you feel about doing a record? And John says, okay. <laughs> this is where things are going to get really frustrating and upsetting. So John gets this call from Leonard. Now remember, John was somewhat in awe of Leonard. John really saw Leonard as a mentor, as someone who gave him a big break in the industry because John was just playing at that hotel one day when Leonard had come up to him and said, let's record an album. I'll fly you to the United States. So John's whole connections with Columbia never would have happened if it weren't for Leonard Cohen. So when Leonard Cohen is calling him saying, let's do another record, he's kind of not going to say no. During the time Leonard Cohen had been in either a Greece with Dominique, he had been writing books upon books upon books of poem stanzas that ultimately became the verses for Hallelujah. And Dominique says at that time, from like 1982 to 1983, she's living with Leonard Cohen. She said that Leonard would literally wake up in the morning, have his morning coffee, and work on these verses. And then he'd go to lunch, and then he'd come back and work on the verses. It was like Ernest Hemingway, just in a pocket of the house, writing away like a madman. Now Leonard is approaching John. He has all of these books, you know, of words, of stanzas, and verses. And it's not just Hallelujah. He has other music, too. And he comes to John and says, I need you to put music to this. So John puts music to most of his songs for this next album, which ended up being called Various Physicians. One of those songs being Hallelujah. John remembers putting together the music for Hallelujah. He said he wanted to channel this gospel feeling and this gospel vibe. A lot of the verses were focused around religion and God, and that was kind of the whole purpose of the song. The singer is having an argument with God, not an argument, but he's trying to reconcile in his mind, you know, this side of him that is so spiritual and so religious with this other side that is just such a sinner and so immersed in this sinful life. What's even more frustrating to me about this story is not just the unfairness that John went through with Leonard Cohen, but I'm also extremely frustrated because I feel like even though the song has been elevated and has made its way into America and into our culture and into everything that we want it to have made its way into, I think it took a long time for it to re-establish 
its true context. And even now, when you see renditions of it, they omit a really important part of the song, in my opinion. When John gets this original song, though, he had those original verses. John and Leonard finished the song Hallelujah and finished the album Various Positions. They were very excited once they finished because they knew what they had was really good. They were very excited to take it to Columbia and see where everything was going to go with this. Unfortunately, after they took it to Columbia, there was a new head guy at Columbia. It was no longer Clive Davis. It was a man named Walter, not to name any names, Walter. Walter ruined. So like, oh, first of all, Walter hated Leonard Cohen. He hated him. He was not a Leonard Cohen guy. And listen, I get it. A lot of Leonard Cohen songs were very, um, literal, should I say? Is that a good word? Literal? I'll put some of the links to some of the other Leonard Cohen songs in the description down below, and you'll know what I mean when I say his songs were very literal. I can see why he didn't like Leonard Cohen, but what was very unfair and frustrating about this is Columbia had already paid for this record, Various Positions, to be made. And it is very rare and inappropriate and uncalled for and bizarre to pay for an album to be made and then reject the album. So once they finish this album and bring it to Walter, Walter hates it and refused to put the record out in America. The record ended up being released in Europe, but Leonard really wanted it to be in America. He wanted it to start circulating into American music. He came to Walter several times and said, what's wrong with the song? Tell me what you don't like about the song. He said that when he would go in to speak with Walter, Walter would be condescending to him. He doesn't say these words, but this is the feeling that you get, that Walter was condescending to him. Walter made a comment on Leonard's suit at one point when Leonard came in in his suit and Leonard said, I think his exact words were that Walter, quote, reviewed his suit. It's just mean and rude. That's all I have to say about Walter. And it's just proof of how awful the record labels can be and how wrong they can be. This was a very good song and it's very frustrating that Walter got to be the man who made that decision to just eliminate it completely as if it had never happened at all. At one point, Leonard said to Walter, what specifically do you not like about this song? Because Walter was not giving him constructive criticism. He was just saying, I don't like it. I'm not playing it. I don't like you. Walter finally says to Leonard, well, I don't like the way it's mixed. So Leonard said, okay, you mix it. We'll have someone else mix it. You can find someone to mix it. You mix it yourself. I don't care. Whoever wants to remix it, remix it. I just want it to be played. And Walter said, no. He was like, no, we're not going to have anybody remix it. But he's like, but that's what you just said, that you didn't like the mix. So very, very frustrating. Leonard, I think, was way more frustrated than he really wanted to let on. He needed, at the same time, someone to blame for this because it wasn't making any sense to him why this guy was just shooting it down. He needed to put the blame somewhere. He ended up putting it on John Lasauer. John had been so excited about this connection with Leonard Cohen, and if it hadn't been for Leonard Cohen, John never would have made that connection with Columbia. He never would have had the career that he had as a composer had it not been for Leonard Cohen. And then Leonard Cohen just comes in on the attack, coming for John, um, bad-mouthing him around the industry, saying that John's composition is the reason this song is being denied. At one point, someone who didn't even work with John, barely even knew John, said to John, quote, you'll never work in this town again, kid. John was completely broken by all of this. And so much so that John never made another album. He's, he literally left the music industry after all of this drama. And I don't know if part of him started to blame himself, but it's just really upsetting because I think we can all agree that we love the music of Hallelujah even more than the, you know, just as much, if not more than the lyrics. Uh, the music is so beautiful. And John was such a talented composer. And it's so upsetting that these words and this drama and these accusations tore him down like that. And even though Leonard's words to John really broke John and, you know, caused him to leave the industry, Leonard was kind of the opposite. And he was also getting a lot of negative rhetoric from people in the industry over this song. But Leonard was a little bit different in the fact that he did not let these negative comments change his perspective on his music. And he refused to back down. He refused to believe he wasn't good. You know, he kind of 
put the blame on why that album got rejected on John. Like, well, it was John's fault. It's not my fault. My work is really good. I'm really good. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to stop making music. All this drama went down around 1984, 1985, kind of a time frame. And a few years later, it was like 1988, Leonard Cohen goes on tour for this album that never made it in America, but he starts going and performing the songs live anyway. While performing live, he starts singing Hallelujah. Now, most people had never heard this song before. The only people who had really heard it were the people who had worked on Hallelujah at Columbia with Leonard Cohen in the first place. But when Leonard started singing it live, he started singing verses that nobody had heard before. And I don't just mean people in the crowd. I mean, even the people in his band or the people who were part of his entourage and part of his group, no one had heard these words before. And they started hearing them and started thinking, is this a whole new song? Did he write a whole new song? And little did they know, Leonard had about a hundred different verses and different versions of this song in all these different notebooks. And now that he was doing this song live, he knew nobody knew it. He knew nobody had heard it. And he knew it hadn't even been circulated in the United States. So I think he felt like he had that freedom to kind of play around with the song and sing the words that really meant something to him, the words that held the most weight in his heart. He could perform live and nobody would be like, those aren't the words, boo. In the original 1984 Hallelujah song, the one that made it on the album, the one that was circulated in Europe and denied in America, were the same verses that we know today that's been covered by almost every artist, you know, under the sun. But when Leonard Cohen was singing this live, he was singing some of the verses that were more religious and more focused on his spirituality and where he was, you know, in his relationship with God. And they were very, very personal and heavy lyrics. He started his live shows with the verse, baby, I've been here before. I've seen this room and I've walked this floor. I used to live alone before I knew ya. And I've seen your flag on the marble arch. Love is not a victory march. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. There was a time you let me know what was really going on below, but now you never show it to me, do ya? And remember when I moved in you, the holy dove was moving too, and every breath we drew was hallelujah. Well, maybe there's a God above, but all I ever learned from love was how to shoot at somebody who outdrew you. It's no complaint you hear tonight. It's not some pilgrim who's seen the light. It's a cold and it's a lonely hallelujah. And then the last stanza is the one that we know today too. So I think those new lyrics, you know, really moved the crowd in a way that the original song might not have moved them. We don't know for sure. But what we do know is after Leonard Cohen started singing those new verses live, the crowd response was incredible. People loved the song. At one point, Leonard Cohen was playing a live show in New York City when someone in the audience named John Cale saw him sing Hallelujah. John Cale absolutely loved the song Hallelujah. It moved him just as much as it was moving everyone else in the crowd. So John Cale ends up getting in touch with Leonard Cohen's management and saying he wants to do a cover of it. And they were very excited about this. They totally agreed. Well, John Cale didn't feel comfortable singing the verses that were more spiritual and more religious and very personal. So he just kind of took the verses that he says, quote unquote, were the cheeky verses about you know, the love part and the woman part and kind of leaving out that whole aspect of God and religion, which to me was the whole purpose of the song, which is what is so upsetting. It's like this, you know, conversation that he's trying to have with God and with David. And it's so much bigger than those, you know, little verses that John Cale took. But John Cale decided those were the verses he wanted. And people said to John, look, there are tons of verses out there. Try to get a hold of all the verses. And it's unclear if John Cale ever got a hold of every single verse, uh, but he did at least get all of the verses from the live show performances that Leonard Cohen was doing and the verses that were on the album. So he kind of did combine some of those verses in his version. But like I said, it feels like there was more context to the song that did get lost. But John Cale starts doing this tribute album and Hallelujah was one of his songs. It ended up charting for John Cale. And it was really because of John Cale that the song Hallelujah even made it into America in the first place. Now, while John Cale might have brought a new life to the song Hallelujah, it was Jeff Buckley who ended up bringing it all the way into an everlasting afterlife. Now, Jeff Buckley could be his own roots rockumentary, you know, completely separate from this, but 
I will quickly say that the way this kind of fell together for Jeff Buckley, he was the son of a musician named Tim Buckley. There was a church called St. Mary's. St. Mary's would have performances of various artists come and go, and they also wanted the shows to be this sort of immersed experience for anybody who was there. St. Mary's was putting on a show. They wanted Tim Buckley to come play. They were trying to get a hold of Tim Buckley, but his management said to them, well, he's not really available, but you know what? He does have a son named Jeff, who is also a very good singer. So St. Mary's said, okay, well, we'll have Jeff come play. Jeff goes to St. Mary's and it's his first time playing live anywhere. He wasn't even sure if he was a good singer or not. It turned out that the crowd loved Jeff and Jeff decided, you know, maybe I am better than I thought I was. So Jeff started playing live shows in the neighborhood. St. Mary's, the church where he had originally played, ended up having John Cale come in and play the version of Hallelujah from Leonard Cohen's album. Well, St. Mary's loved the song Hallelujah and they knew Jeff Buckley. He was coming in and out all the time. So one of the women who worked at St. Mary's gave the song Hallelujah to Jeff and said, I just think you're going to love this song. Maybe you can play it at some of your gigs at this restaurant that you play at. And Jeff said, sure, he was only playing cover songs, you know, at the bar. He wasn't playing his original music. Well, one day he's just playing at the bar when someone who works at Columbia Records comes in and hears him playing, loved his sound, knew he was Tim Buckley's son, and immediately gave him a record deal at Columbia. And from there, Jeff Buckley got the rights to do a cover of Hallelujah for an actual album. This rendition would become so incredibly popular, but the year that this was all kind of going down was 1993-1994. Right around the time where Jeff Buckley is recording Hallelujah, Leonard Cohen has decided to leave America. I think he left America, or maybe no, he might have been in America. Let's just say he left society and Leonard Cohen went to live at a monastery. He, I mean, like I said, he definitely drank too much and things were just too hard for him. So he went to this monastery to reconnect with himself and to calm down and recenter his life. While he's there in isolation, Jeff Buckley is recording Hallelujah and going on tour, singing Hallelujah, finishing almost every show with the song Hallelujah. Hallelujah is being so well accepted from everyone who heard the song is absolutely blowing up in America. And Leonard Cohen has no idea because he's isolated in a monastery, you know, meditating. And it was just maybe two or three years before Leonard Cohen emerges from this monastery that Jeff Buckley tragically died. Jeff Buckley never got to see the fame of Hallelujah and how big it actually became. And there's a lot of people out there who think that maybe Hallelujah never would have gotten that big had Jeff not tragically died because it was actually through his death that the song really held this, you know, different type of weight that it didn't have before. It's almost like Jeff was put on this earth to bring Hallelujah to what it needed to be, you know? Um, and it, it's just so incredibly sad, but also so beautiful that this song has become what it's become because of Jeff Buckley. And it's also just kind of so interesting to me that all of this is happening while Leonard Cohen is at this monastery. And it was just, I think, two years after Jeff's death that Leonard emerges from the monastery and sees everything that Hallelujah had become. After Jeff Buckley died, obviously, lots of people started covering Hallelujah. And um, pretty much every musician who has ever existed since 1993 knows the song now, Hallelujah. They know the chords, they know the words, they've probably done it live at least once. And what's so beautiful about this song, and anyone who does it, whether it's live or whether it's a formal cover, Every cover or every time I hear this song sung by anybody, it just seems like the words and the music take people out of their typical comfort level, you know, out of their typical realm of what their music usually sounds like. It just kind of elevates the musician as they sing it. And there's just this power behind the song that you can't really explain. It's just it's like magic. As of now, 2023, there are over 50 versions of the song Hallelujah that have been covered by over 300 various artists. I'm going to put some of my favorite links to Hallelujah covers in the description down below. And if you have a favorite Hallelujah cover, please mention it in the comments below so that we can go and see different types of covers and different types of interpretations. Obviously, it has also been covered in multiple languages across the world. And of course, anytime someone plays Hallelujah, Leonard Cohen, Jeff Buckley, everybody, like 
everyone who was a part of it just lives on. Their legend lives on through this song. Also, if you are a Roots Music History member, I am going to be putting the full verses to Hallelujah as a members only video. It's very difficult to get a cover that has every single verse. And there are some videos out there that say all the verses, you know, to Hallelujah, and it's not all the verses. <laughs> You're missing one. So we're going to have every single verse as a video available to level three members. If you are a level three, Roots Music History member, then you have access to all of the full interviews that I have done with people who have been part of the Roots documentaries. Um, if you saw the Roots documentary about the 619-year-old tree that George Washington had his field hospital on in the Revolutionary War, that tree is being made into guitars and it is the most beautiful story. And there's not that many views on it and it's my favorite story. So please go watch it and give it a thumbs up if you like it. It's just such a touching story. Um, and the full interviews that I have with the luthiers and the guitar makers who played a role in that and the lumber supplier, they're all for members only. Uh, Chris Coleman of Coleman Bass Works. If you're a bass player, you might know him uh, or have heard of him. I've got the full interview with him up there. And I also might get uh, Randy Rhodes' sister to do an interview on there for the members only We'll see. That's pending. Um, but we have a few a few connections that have been made that might be coming uh, onto the members only platform. I'm thinking about making a Patreon as well, although that would be extra work. <laughs> um, so it might be easier to just join as a member and get access to everything in one place. Let me know what you guys think. Do you think that I should do a Patreon or do you think a members only um, kind of a setup is just as effective? And tell me what you would prefer. Um, but if you are just a subscriber, then you still get access to all of the Roots documentaries like this, the formal storytelling, the formal podcasts. That's what the Root documentaries are. That's what you get as a subscriber. Subscribing to the channel is completely free and is the best way to support the channel by subscribing, giving it a thumbs up and commenting. It really helps boost the channel in YouTube's algorithm so that more people get to see this type of content. And of course, I will see you guys on the next Roots documentary. Hungry for the road all my life Thirsty for adventure all my youth Chasing all my friends